and it will show the speed. The, the, the ideal case here is where the internal energy here is defined at this ratio of P over rho, and this constant, quantity gamma minus 1. So that is uh, the sequence we want to tackle, and we obviously want to solve this numerically, so the fact that the speeding approach adopts the following approach. You split the flux in two parts, in, into an advection part and a pressure part. So this is conventional. And then you want to compute the numerical flux as a response here to that interface, the sum of uh, the kind of flux for the advection and the kind of flux for the pressure part. So that is, uh, is well accepted and it is uh, the, the framework in which several schemes actually work. Classical flux method is pretty the schemes here, and we have Steer and Warming flux from the 81, 1981, Van Lee and 1982, Sad Bill, Jane 1993, and at the same year, Liu Step. Of all of these, I think the one I would prefer is the new Stephen because it incorporates something new into the field of rapid splitting method, which is the ability to resolve a quantum dispositivity. The other method, we don't have that capability, or did not have. So that's, that's a, a, a jump ahead in the game of designing the American method for the, the other equations along the lines of flat vector splitting. And of course, as you are aware, perhaps, is that these have given rise to a series of papers and names under the, the, the name of AUSM plus minus ZX asterisk and so on. But as you have names about different uh, versions of this particular approach. Okay, so by far, then, therefore, this is the most. The most uh, Successful of those uh, of those approaches. <clears throat> now, uh, how does it work? Uh, you uh, split, as uh, the name tells us, the flux into into these two parts. So this is your step. So this is the pressure <coughs> part here, and this is the pressure part. part. The pressure essentially is just split the pressure. So it is a scalar one. And of course, the velocity u is multiplied all these three quantities here, so the advection part is a vector multiplied by the velocity. And therefore, providing a winding for this part here is, is automatic, it's, it depends on the sign of that velocity. The problem is to find the pressure, the pressure term here, and I must confess that when I, we began looking at this with Elena Vasquez, eh, we tried to understand the reasoning behind uh, the choice of the pressure term following the AUSM uh, approach, and, and we, we put, I couldn't follow it. And that actually gave rise to the intention of trying to find an alternative way of doing this. Now, once you've done the splitting, then you can recopulate this a little bit here following your step, and uh, you can uh, uh, have the width in terms of the math number here by, the, by defining this quantity here. And then you do the awaiting of that in the obvious way according to the sign of the math. So for the pressure, I'm not going to say anything because this is in the literature and, uh, and as I said, this is the part that uh, put uh, to the <coughs> about the approach. Now what we intend to do here is the following. Uh, but before that, I must say that the, the scheme that we proposed three years ago has already been applied in the literature, and this is probably not complete. Uh, these guys here, Pascal and Jan Kapin and, and, and this lane, applied this method to published in the, in the journal, uh, also this paper here, and then my, my colleague, Michael Wilson and Casuli, also applied it in, in a way that I will describe in a few minutes. And then Balsara and Montesinos, and to some extent myself, apply this to the, the magnetic hydrodynamic equations. So, what do we do? Let's consider the three dimensional case, and then the, let's consider the flux in the normal direction, not to say <coughs> here. And so, what we need to do here is to split this into two parts here an advection part and a pressure part. So, the total energy here is the 
given by the uh, kinetic energy and the and the energy here, uh, and then you have to appreciate that the pressure is not just at the terms here, the pressure is also present here and here. So the way we're going to approach this is to split really every pressure term on the vessel. Okay. So the pressure flux is going to contain all the pressure uh, adopting a, a general equation of state and making some assumptions about hypervelocity, uh, we have these relations here with the sound speed, and then uh, it is convenient to introduce the, uh, the mean release form here so that you can actually write several equations of the state in, in terms of this, uh, of this convention here. We are going to treat two equations here the John Wilkinson Lee equation of state, which is well known in the area of explosion, explosions and the short waves generated by chemical reactions. And These two equations are very nonlinear, and so we chose them as two because they are examples of strong nonlinearities, and therefore they are very challenging. A reference is about the the Riemann problem for general questions of the state. We have a partial list here. I really recommend this, this classical paper here by many of our flow in reviews of modern physics where they, they review the subject of the Riemann problem for a general physics. So let's go back then to our uh, aim of splitting the flux. And so what we have here is the following splitting. We have an advection part of the left hand side and a pressure part of the right hand side, but in addition to the pressure from the momentum equation, we have pressure terms coming from the energy equation. And here we still can do advection, so if we take the velocity out here, the normal velocity u, so we would have here advection of this quantities here, which means advection of mass, momentum, and kinetic energy. That would be the interpretation for the advection part. So here we have now a, a vector that contains uh, pressure points. So the idea here uh, that uh, we proposed with the linear was to consider two separate systems out of the splitting. So each part of the splitting gives rise to a separate uh, system. So the first system here we're going to uh, call it the advection system. This is the part, the advection part of the flask. And this is what we call the pressure system. In the linear advection case, if you do a little bit of algebra, actually you can, you can find that this is quite legitimate to do, and if you, you can fit the information of one part into the other very nicely. In fact, it is actually exactly like this. We wanted to do the same for the other equations, but we actually found that it was not necessary, so we stopped. Uh, uh, considering the possibility of interaction of this, what we simply do here now, <coughs> is, is we find that the pressure system gives you all the information that you actually need to determine the advection part and the pressure part. So we recast the pressure system in, 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 in the periods here, and you have this, uh, this matrix here. The system is hyperbolic, and it has a very peculiar structure. You see that the eigenvalues, the left and right eigenvalues 1 and 5 here, are this form. 1 half u minus capital A, 1 half u plus capital A, where A here involves obviously the particular equation of the state that you are concerned with. The middle eigenvalues are repeated here. You have three repeated zero eigenvalues here that are associated with the contacts and shear waves. And what is uh, very interesting to note as well, and I will uh, mention this before, is that this system is actually, well, it's actually a really here. This system is subsonic. Almost. Can you see? That is almost there, it's almost possible. So that's very interesting because one of the problems of treating fluxes uh, or, or schemes or completely the mega flux is to deal with the sonic clock. Okay, so linearizations actually fail, you have to introduce a, an entropy fix and so on. 
Uh, <clears throat> so that, that is the uh, attack. So hyperbolicity holds and is absorbed. Uh, so uh, as I said, this is attractive from the point of view of numerical implementations. You, will need, you don't need to do something for the solution at all. You know that the model has to be subsonic state. For multi-component flow, the multiplicity will just grow by the number n if you have n species equations added to the order. Now, this uh, scheme recognizes exactly contact circuit associated with species equations as well, as we shall demonstrate in the TV. Now, the vertical flux is, uh, is the obvious one uh, for the advection. It depends on the sign of the velocity, but of course we have to provide the velocity. Uh, and then for the pressure flux, the pressure flux involves the equation of the state here, you can see here. Uh, and then uh, it has only two non-zero components here. So the problem that is left here is to compute estimates for the pressure, for the normal velocity, and for the density. But actually, the density is already determined, as you shall see, is either the data on the left or the data on the right. So, we began with the flux vector splitting method and we came back to the rhythm problem. We couldn't escape it because having this very nice hyperbolic system, we are very tempted to pose the rhythm problem and see what happens. Now, the Riemann problem has a very nice structure here. It has two ways, one negative, one positive, and you have three repeated eigenvalues right along the t-axis. So you can linearize this problem, uh, linearize the rhythm in areas, and you get a very simple solution, which is in 3940. Now, that is the normal velocity, this is the pressure, this is the tensor. Now, uh, if you apply this approach to conventional gas dynamics to compute the full flux, uh, the volume of flux with that linearization, this uh, approximation fails miserably. It's not useful at all. The only runs for some convention. It turns out that for this particular system here, it works very well and it is exceedingly robust. And uh, so uh, uh, we are happy with this uh, uh, solution procedure, taking I to determine the, uh, the pressure, the pressure uh, uh, flux, and therefore also the the advection flux, because once you have the velocity there, you also have the advection flux. So everything is determined. So that's it. This is for general equations of the state. Uh, some properties of the scheme. Uh, uh, the subsonic nature of it is very attractive. I did that before. The uh, positivity of the density can, can be demonstrated under and, and a very mild uh, uh, CFL type condition based on the velocity. So this is really very generous. Uh, uh, and that is indeed attractive. We can reinterpret some existing uh, flux vector splitting approaches utilizing the same approach. And as a matter of fact, one can rescue the uh, subvision splitting if we adopt the same numerical approach. The splitting, there's nothing we can do about it because they are splitting it this. They took one term of the energy equation and put it here, but they still left a pressure term to the that energy equation given by the equation. <laughs> uh, we analyze some of the properties of this method here, and one can prove that the scheme that we propose can recognize exactly isolated stationary contacts and, and also shear waves. Now, this is a very important property because uh, the resolution of intermediate fields is a challenge even for good and good methods that are not complete, that is to say, do not resolve the full structure of the Riemann problem. Uh, we can also prove that the subject approach cannot sustain isolated stationary contacts. 
However, we can rescue this scheme here, apply our, our numerical approach, and this can then recognize a stationary quantum discontinuity. Some problems, trigger ones, trigger certificate. These are the only equations here with a single stationary discontinuity for density at time zero. So the solution of that problem in the same initial transition it should remain completely unperturbed. But it is a challenge to actually get a solution correctly because you, you will smear it like the Van Lier flat vector speeding, for example, and you never stop smearing the problem. So you have low propagation of these fronts you will smear them without uh, stop. If, as I mentioned before, before we proved that this is the case for the sub region, but this is an experiment here that shows you the sub region scheme cannot sustain anything, anything that resembles that the stationary continuous continuity, but we can rescue that scheme by adopting our approach. If very, very tough problems here, you have the you have the Woodward and Cholera blast work problem, and that was a test problem designed in 1984 by Woodward and Cholera to blast out numerical methods. And uh, of course, it is indeed very challenging. And here we see a comparison here. The, the comparison here is between our proposed method, here, first order, first order, in first order mode, here, 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 here compared to the Go to the method with the exact result. There is no difference. Okay? I also put a reference to a second order solution of the same problem, but actually I have to take it out because here the reference solution is the go to the method with the exact result. That is the reference solution for first order monotony. <coughs> here we apply the scheme to, uh, in this case, with a non-linear general equation of state, a general double-layer equation of state, and we invented this Google and Colella test problem, but now with this general equation of state, and we made a comparison here between, again, the coordinate method with the standard result because my collaborator wrote an exact ribbon solver for this ribbon problem for this equation. It's very challenging to do it, but they did that. And so we could actually compare the performance of the schemes. <coughs> And there is uh, uh, at least graphically no difference. Then, if we apply this to other test problems here, we see some little difference between the golden method and the sapphire result of general equations of the state. Here, we can see that our method tends to be a little bit more diffusive here, but on the other hand, it doesn't have these tiny oscillations that the golden method of the sapphire result has, as we all know. Efficiency here. Now, a, a criticism that people have made to me on this is that I am comparing in a sense with myself. <laughs> I compare it here in our method with one that uh, we had and I published a few years ago, which is the thought solver that has been referenced to uh, in some of the talks in this, in this uh, workshop. Uh, the thought solver is is like a tractor. It is exceedingly robust, very gentle, and as soon as you have the idea of traction of your system, you have a real result. So that's very powerful because if you don't have it, you can actually calculate it also numerically, and again, you have a real result. But it is a place. So here, what we have done is what I call an efficiency plot, which I believe is the way to look at the medical method. So we have an error here versus cost. No mesh. The mesh is behind, and incidental. What matters here, in my view, is the error of the cost. So here we choose, we choose an error here, for example, this level here, and then we have to intersect these two lines here, this one here, and this one here. And the one that intersects out of this, this horizontal line is the winner. It has the lowest CPU time to achieve that error. And so you can see the figures here, 511 and 32.99. So there is a, a gain of a factor of about 15 of 5. So that is tremendous efficiency scale. So that is a way to, as 
assess the medical method, which I think is probably a suggestion that I will start to do in, in this conference here. Van der Waals and so on. Then we extend this to higher order, but of course the approach we adopt is a mediator approach. Let me just make a few remarks here, as uh, Michael Dutzan mentioned yesterday, this is something that goes back a quite a long time. Actually, it goes back longer than that. It's something that I began working in 1992. And it was only in, in the late 90s that uh, uh, Richard Millington, uh, a Mancunian man, a uh, fan of Manchester City, they took it up and we managed to make progress and they, we uh, they produced this uh, account in 2001 for Godinus Beth in, in Oxford in 1999, actually, it was held this uh, particular meeting. As I was saying to some colleagues later on, when I presented this work in front of Godinus, who was sitting here in the front row, at the end of the talk he asked me, he stood up, of course, I said, from Russia, he stood up and asked me the question. So what is the stability of the world? Uh, for the media election question, one thing, I said, one. He said, I don't believe it, and he sat down. And it is good. That's good. But he still doesn't believe it. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so there's been a lot of progress here, and you have a long list of people that are some key people here that might do some iterate and so on, and uh, uh, developments, uh, tremendous developments in this approach that we see today. And the point of higher order vacuums, and I talk here, this is something that uh, my collaborators in Stuttgart did in 2006, when Michael was uh, there at the time. Uh, it's a question of what is the point of efficient or high order vacuums? And we all talk about high order vacuums, and what is the point of that? apart from writing another paper and so on to add to our CD. And, and the, the point is simply efficient. Because if you want to compute accurate solutions to PDEs, high order are the ones that give you a small error at the smallest computational cost. It's as simple as that. So that is the reason, the practical reason why why you choose high order. Here you have a very good experiment in two dimensions for linear acoustics. And uh, my colleagues implemented this uh, approach, the other approach, from order 1 to 48. Is that right? And what we are showing here is order 2 to 24. Okay. And so the various curves here are the various orders here. And if you choose an error, any error here, you are going to intersect some of these curves. And of course, you will intersect first the high order. Okay. There are issues here, for example, the order, the, uh, the increasing here is a question of representation of numbers of computers because this is an issue where you are implementing these methods to very high order markets. Uh, so efficiency. By, by a huge margin as well, not, not just by you know, small factors. Uh, I'm going to miss the description of the approach, but let me just say one thing that the scheme can be understood in a very simple way as a method that relies on high order nonlinear reconstructions in the case of fundamental <coughs> or alternatively the existence of polynomial representation of the data as in the G. Either of them. One. Number two, solution of the generalized or high order of control. That's it. Once you have those two ingredients, the numerical flux follows as an integration of the time dependent solution along the interface to compute the numerical flux. If there is a source, of course, you have to do some extra work. And this is the difference between the classical Riemann problem that would be coding of method here, and that would be a generalized here. As a demonstration and a general problem. Uh, uh, now, for the classical Riemann problems, that is to say, piecewise constant data, there is a tremendous body of literature on, on this. Okay, and as I was saying earlier, okay, there seems to be no end. To that. But then, for the general Riemann problem, you know, the work has begun 
uh, as well. You know, we already have about six rivers solved here for the general ladder control. The first practical one uh, I claim is the one with Titerio in 1972, uh, Castro was one of my PhD students, uh, Michael Dunsa, uh, recently Gersaniske in Hamburg, uh, published a very nice paper because with TTRF we committed some little crimes that needed mathematical justification. And uh, these guys actually did a very good job in trying to justify some work. Uh, of all of these, I think I must say that there are two classes of ribbons or solo for the general animal problem. Uh, the case in which you do not have the stiff soft terms and the case in which you do have the stiff soft terms. That is the difference. And the method that does a good job for the stiff soft terms is the one published by, by Tunsar and, and, and collaborators here in 2008. There is also another one here, a recent bit, 2015, a, a published with a Gino Montesino, one of my PhD students, but it has a, a little disadvantage in the sense that it is an implicit semi-analytic and relies on the Portugal-Valesco procedure, which is a very important procedure, and you have to make intensive use of uh, symbolic manipulation in order to achieve it. So that's it. The, more or less the state of the art when it comes to the solve of the general problem. Now we apply this technology to our first order flux vector splitting scheme. And we implement this in two dimensions, for example, and we in this case we show schemes up to four order vacuums, of course, but one can do a, a high order in linear. The same numerical methods, non-linear numerical methods, that have that accuracy must also be able to solve problems with shock waves and we can see here uh, this is done with uh, the I conclude we have presented three extensions of the of the flux vector splitting scheme that, that was the main focus of this presentation for general equations of extension for classical media motor space dimensions and then we extend this to high order of accuracy on the construction meshes and I will say the performance is satisfactory. Uh, now, some uh, additional remarks. The scheme can also be used for semi split approaches, such as we in the Ranger Cut, Cut out PG, Cinti Ranger Cut, and so on. Uh, so you could actually have uh, one step is put in relative uh, schemes of arbitrary accuracy in the present time if you want to do that. Uh, this is an important point. One of the motivations for the work initially was to be able to separate fast waves from slow waves in order perhaps to treat the fast wave in an implicit fashion. But with the lender, we never got there. We got stuck with, with, the, uh, with what I presented here. But uh, Michael, of course, uh, being so fast at this, he already applied this with Kasuli uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, getting very quick in the sound. Treating the pressure terms implicitly and the objection explicitly with a current number that is probably close to one. Close to one, but the objection is a big number step. Steve so then you can treat, of course, no problem. And you can apply this, and we are doing that actually. Uh, for advection diffusion reaction equations converted to PDEs which are hyperbolic with the stiff soft terms. So you have a hyperbolic solver that deals with the stiff soft terms, you can solve advection diffusion reaction equation using this uh, particular approach. And, uh, so I think it's probably time to stop. Thank you very much. To some extent, uh, it is also uh, interesting to see the structure of the Riemann solver having split away the advective part. Yeah. It looks now like what people typically use in the Lagrangian yes. uh, community, right? Yeah. Because you basically go yeah. into a co moving flow. Yeah. 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 So, regarding the generalized Riemann problem that you mentioned, yes. you mentioned briefly. So what are the, the primes that you could need to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay. Uh, if 
I may have to go back a few times. Uh, we, so then let's start from the linear. So now, now Saturn fits the ground, right? Now. So there is a big break. The, uh, a board would be very nice here, very useful, because I don't know whether I have anything here that I can show you that explains it. I will explain it by words. Now, in the first Riemann solver that we devised with Titanet, they rely on a Taylor series expansion of the solution along the T-axis based on the first time interaction of the waves. So the solution will be smooth along there, in most cases, and later on waves are turned back onto the T-axis. Okay? So you can make the assumption of a smooth and therefore you can apply the, the Taylor series expansion. Then if you use the Cauchy coalescence procedure, you end up with function as of a space derivatives. But the space derivatives are the interface, you don't have them. You have them in the reconstruction data, left and right, because you have polynomials. <laughs> now, we realized that this, the space derivatives, the gradients, and so on, for the linear case, actually obey the same differential equations that you have. I didn't know this. And so we use that fact that is valid for the linear case, for the non-linear case. In that case, if you have evolution equation for the space derivatives, you can pose a Riemann problem for the space derivatives and solve it. And therefore, you have values of the uh, radius and carriages and all derivatives at the interface, and therefore you have all the terms. Okay. So what, what we did there then was to linearize the evolution equations and assume that the source terms that come on the right hand side were zero. So two simplifications. These two simplifications do not sacrifice accuracy. You still get the same convergent rates that you pay. But it was a little bit uncomfortable to explain this. And so uh, Klaus uh, and uh, Iske in Hamburg actually justify this, not for everything, but for some uh, typical non-linear problems. So, I have confessed. <laughs> and this is going to appear in 2016. Uh, 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 I think it's already out online, I think. To that oh, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it has to be in 2016, but it is already online available. Okay. 